Welcome to Polycast, the official podcast of a Poulton civilization site. Dan Quick, Walter Schneiders, Imran Siddiqui, and Michael Wood. With guest co host Nathos from CFC. Can everyone hear everyone else? I hear the people I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> Welcome to Polycast, the official podcast of the Polton Civilization site. This is episode 34. I'm joined by Mackie. Hello. Wouter. Hi. Are we missing someone? Yeah, actually. Imran, he's not going to be joining us. Because he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, it's Mathos from CFC. He's back. Hello. Holy crap. <laughs> Wow. Keyboard of death. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Imran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, crap. Hey, do you remember what I'm logged in as? At Polly? <laughs> You're, you... <laughs> it's me. <laughs> Methos from CFC. Methos at from CFC? <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> Apparently, Wouter let us know that ruins is more than ruins as a random event is in. We talked about that in episode 33, and I'm looking for some more details on that, so Wouter's going to tell us all about it. <laughs> well, it's already in what there to say. <laughs> if you have ruins in your borders and you wait long enough, you get a event. And I think it gives free science, but I'm not sure about that. Hey, uh, <laughs> you'll have to tell me what my password is because I can't get logged in. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> It says invalid username. <laughs> Get your caps lock on or something? I will give you your exact username as well then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be right back, cell phone ringing. Okay. Oh, now he really is Imran. <laughs> <laughs> now, who wants to do modcast? Why do I even have to ask that question? Because you're nice enough to assume that somebody other than me will jump up and go, me, 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 me. <laughs> What do we talk about in the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> this week in the modcast, we talked about whether the statue of Zeus is overpowered or not. Had a little bit about frigates, privateers, and ships of the line. Discussed that maybe about a tweak to banks and universities. Also, maybe not. And for a brief moment, we considered the craziness of bringing back terrain improvements. In the Senate, we talk a lot about wonders. We talk about the Apostolic Palace. We talk about running a wonder economy. The five best and worst wonders of the world. And also some non-wonder stuff. What the hell did they include musket men for in the game? And is founding multiple religions an advantage? A visit to the vault reveals an examination of Brian Reynolds on Civilization II's development. Civ 4 not requiring great hardware and honorable mentions for the previously revealed top 10 clues that you are too obsessed with the game. In Research Lab, we talked about uh, Shaka is King's three ideas for corporations. And in the mailbag, we have a voicemail from Michael Lucas Smith telling us that diplomacy is broken in multiplayer and looking back on Polycast in 2007. I remember, Mathos, when you were on last time, you did the introduction, so I won't ask you to do it again. But you might be asked to do the closing, so just be ready for that. Okay, practice first. <laughs> Maki and Wilder. Yay! Maki, Wilder. Maki, Here we Wilder. go. <laughs> and done. I mean, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> done. <laughs> Modcast time? Yep. Yay! Woo! Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the Modcast, where we talk about various hot topics on all the different forums to talk about Sue. All right, over in the Modcast, Statue of Zeus overpowered, question mark. Mr. Sivtastic asks, what's the true story behind the Statue of Zeus? 
Is it that strong to just cripple a sieve more than my axes and arrows, or should I build it simply because I can't handle being on the wrong end of it? Quote, unquote. As wonder doubles the war and weariness of civilizations fighting against you. Is it overpowered? Well, it really is a good idea to build it. I don't know that it's overpowered, but I hate to be in the receiving end of it. <laughs> well, it's powerful, but I agree. I don't know that it's overpowered. It's something to deal with, but, you know. I'm more of the builder type, so it's never really been that big of a problem for me. And if usually if I decide to go to war with someone, I build up so many units and attack, and they usually wipe them out fairly quickly, so... Yeah, but depending on the difficulty level, you may not have enough of an advantage. So when you get into those wars where you're almost at tech parity, that's when it's really good because although war weariness is supposed to not affect the AI as much, it does affect them. And if you can slow down their production units just that much, you can get at least a numerical advantage on your side. Yeah, I and mean, you really only notice the difference in the longer wars. And I generally don't let wars go on for very long, exactly because of war weariness. Yeah, I think when I've had long wars with it is because I've been on one side of the continent and somebody's declared war on me from the other side of the continent, mm. and it's going to take them forever to get there, and I just let them sit there and suffer the war weariness. <laughs> yeah. So is this wonder something you would be more apt to build if you found yourself in a war and you had the city and the resources to be able to spend the time building that as opposed to adding to your military machine? Or would you build it in advance of a war if you thought it was going to be going on? Or... It's a nice one to have, but once you are at war, I think it's a bit more useful to uh, use those hammers to build actual units. I never build it. I don't even bother with it. I mean, I'm not in war enough to make it matter, and it doesn't really affect me whenever I go to war with somebody else, so I never waste the hammers on it. And you're a builder, you said, like me, so... Yeah. I mean, I don't remember if I've even built it. <laughs> I guess there's, like, nothing else to do with it. Well, even if you're a builder, it's a good deterrent to uh, discourage other ships from going to war with you. True. I don't think it's as overpowered as they seem to think it is. Of frigates, privateers, and ships of the line. This uh, Cerebus IV has a beef about one of the new units beyond the swords introduced to the Civ series. The ship of the line, which has a bonus against frigates and has become, quote, the most powerful thing afloat until ironclads, unquote. Though I would append, even after ironclads, it's still more useful. He says that it seems a bit strange for this unit, the ship of the line should definitely be stronger than anything pre-ironclad, and as a result, it should have a bonus against all naval units, not just frigates. A frigate is stronger than a privateer, but the privateer has a better chance of defeating a ship of the line than a frigate does. Quote-unquote, he wants to know what is going on. Well, technically, the kind of ships that are the privateer-type ships would be, in real life, more maneuverable, and that would kind of equal the real-life version of their advantage. Uh, I don't mind the ship at line being good against the privateers and the East Indiamen and stuff, because that was really handy in a naval game I had the other day, where I had both Ragnar and Joao coming at me. And especially with Ragnar, because he was a little bit behind technology, he was mostly throwing privateers and his old galley fleets at me. So they were very good at cleaning them up. And also, I had some success against galleons, which is one of the things they're intended for, because I, I didn't quite have frigates yet, and I had Joao with his frigates and galleons coming and landing tons of troops on me. <laughs> the difference between a bonus you get versus a frigate and versus a privateer or anything else, I mean, it's a difference of 12 versus 8 or 12 versus 6. I mean, either way, you're going to win pretty much all battles anyway, so that's a bit academic if you ask me. It's really only when you have a heavily damaged ship of the line, then you might risk losing it. I have nothing to add. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay then. <laughs> also in the modcast, a tweak to banks and universities. Herclitus suggests that banks and universities should have the same effect on gold or research production as the settler and worker have on food. The shield cost would need to be tweaked a little bit, quote-unquote, but that's about it. And also, quote, it would encourage city specialization, unquote. 
Dirty Martini, Unimatrix 11, and this GDI Jedi 7. Likes the idea, but a number do not, including Polson's own Joe Stubby 369 Matisse. Herclitus' argument is that banks are not really buildings, but financial institutions, as are universities, educational and research institutions. You must sacrifice some capital for the bank, and you must sacrifice some research work for the education of the next generation to get a bigger return once the institution is up and running, quote, unquote. One of the more interesting positions is uh, Yosho, because he agrees with this on the bank argument, but not the university side. But for me, this just strikes as another gameplay versus realism consideration and let's leave it the way it is yeah Heraclitus seems to have the illusion that the economic model in Civ is even remotely realistic <laughs> 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 and it's not guess what in reality everything costs money basically and you'd have to assign a money cost to every building and every unit in the game yeah everything does cost money I mean my salary alone for doing this show oops <laughs> I've said too much. Mm. <laughs> Mathos, Mackey, <laughs> in agreement? I got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering why, if he's in such a hurry, why do you ride it? Why just wait, write a bigger one, and do it later? <laughs> he actually says, I'm in a bit of a hurry, so I'll be quick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, dude, I have this amazing thought, and I've got to get it down before I forget. <laughs> mm. Finally in the modcast, bring back terrain improvements, says Tommy Tankrush. <laughs> He's longing for a return of the terraforming options workers could perform in Civilization 2. Desert, hills, and jungle could become plains, forest to grassland, glacier to tundra, and grassland to hills. Adding, and don't even get me started on why your workers are unable to plant trees. <laughs> okay, trees, balance issue. <laughs> I think we've been over this a couple of times. <laughs> Yeah, no thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the idea seems neat, but it's just not worth it to me. Also makes absolutely no kind of sense whatsoever. How many hills in real life have been turned into flatland? Not too many, probably. Not even to mention uh, mountains. And how often has, has grassland turned into plains or something like that? That's even more ridiculous. Yeah, being able to turn the train into that large-scale terraforming, and that's more of a science fiction-y type of a thing. Yeah. It's one of those things you would only have the technology for at the end game anyway, and it's like we've talked about having the underwater cities or the space cities like Call to Power. While it would be neat, it's more of a mod thing than an actual game thing, because it really wouldn't get used that much. Yeah, it comes too late in the game to make any kind of impact if you're going to do it like that. Yeah. The only thing you could make a point of is the forest thing. Replanting forest sort of makes sense. But yeah, that's, as you mentioned, it's a gameplay thing. It would be a horrible exploit if you could. Plant, chop, plant, chop, plant, chop. Yeah. Well, isn't it set up now to where, like, if you chop a tile and the, and the forest grows back on its own, you can't get any more hammers from it? Um, so any forest that was planted by the player cannot provide hammers. You could implement that if you want, but I think it would get really confusing. I mean, which force can I still chop effectively and which can't I? Mm. So that would be confusing, I think. Yeah, it'd be hard to remember. You'd have to walk a worker over every time you wanted to check. Yeah. So it seems like everyone's in agreement that nobody wants terraforming back. Nobody here anyway. I like the idea only in the sense that, oh, I could really transform things, and then I think about how unbalancing is that as a gameplay. Yeah. As I think about how I used to exploit that. So, Tommy Tank Rush, if you would like to terraform your terrain in game, just pump up that global warming there, and things will change. <laughs> I have an answer for everything. Shall we move to the Senate? Welcome to the Senate. In this section, we talk about game strategy. The Stark Schneider asks and polls, do you always go for building the Apostolic Palace in your games of Civ IV, again requiring Beyond the Sword? I find myself in the majority here, which is no, build it only under special circumstances. In the poll, about two-thirds have said that. It's a pretty damn powerful wonder. You don't want to be on the receiving end of it. So I guess you don't necessarily have to build it, but you absolutely want to control it. 
building gives you the best shot at controlling it. So, yeah, I do strongly prioritize it. I think about building it only under special circumstances. If I have a religion, and it's my state religion, whether or not I've founded it, if there are other people around me that it is also spread to, then I would be more interested to go for the Apostolic Palace. But if I'm the only one with that religion, for whatever reason... Then you should be turning your hammers into units and conquering them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the two bonuses that you get from that, A, you deny it to the AI, so you can't be on the receiving end of it, because having suddenly five AIs declare war on you is not fun. <laughs> Maybe it is, if you're uh, into that stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> personally, yeah, I prefer to take them on one or two at a time. And the other thing is, you can spread your religion. Yeah, it's one thing that one of these guys mentions that it's great to have with your own state religion, because then the AIs will spread it for you. Of course, if you own the holy thing, a lot of income. Yep. Yeah, and it's down at theology, so you have time in the early game to try and spread it if you're going to build it or realize that you're not going to be able to spread your religion fast enough and also build it. Yeah, you have time to strategize beforehand. At least it's not something that you have to build really super early. Yeah, I, mean, I guess you can use it for that, to spread the religion early. Of course, that really only works on a Pangea map. And personally, I don't care too much for that, but I do use it for the diplomatic control that it gives you. Yeah, if one of the AIs gets it on a totally different continent where their religion was never spread to you, it kind of sucks. Yeah, it does make it a lot harder to invade that continent, then, because all the AIs will likely be one block. Yeah, I don't mind if they build it on another continent, on a multiple continents map, because then it gives me somebody to focus all my people on later. Look, they're over there. They're the enemy. <laughs> 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 they're all just going to hate me anyway, because I haven't had a chance to even see what their religion is. Mm. So I hate them, too. <laughs> okay. I hated you first. <laughs> that other continent, they're heathen religions. Also in the Senate, a wonder economy. Here on Polycast, different types of specialist economies have been talked about over the past 14 months or so that we've been around, and apparently specialist economies have been talked about even before Polycast was in existence. I, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Takabar puts forward an economy based on wonder building, but not completion. In other words, selling unfinished wonder to fuel a 100% tech rate in the early game. What do you want? Marble or stone near the start. Build the same wonder in more than one city, or you cancel it in one city, and then you build it in another city where the production won't be lost, allowing you to stockpile all that production for easy gold. Your capital being your only cottage town and research center, it's around 1500 A.D., Get yourself an early scientist to build the academy and get both civil service and education as soon as possible. Adopt monarchy and not representation government civic. Number five is my favorite. It's best your capital isn't at your border. You don't want your villages pillaged. Well, I think it's best if your capital isn't at your border, period. And then six, transform into a full-blown cottage and specialist economy after researching biology and ensuring your national park and epic wonders are in place. I could think of better things to do with my city. It seems like a waste of hammers, <laughs> waste of turns. I wouldn't even consider this. <laughs> yeah, that seems like an awful lot of work for a very little benefit. You could just build gold directly, you know. <laughs> I'm sure it's slightly less effective, but... There's so many other things you could be doing with your capital city or whatever city than sitting there and wasting time building wonders just for the yeah. gold. It's not, I don't know that it's worth that much. And it's not just one city. I mean, he explicitly says he cancels it in one city and does it in several cities, so he gets gold from all of them. That's just, that's just a waste. <laughs> yeah. Seems like a huge waste of hammers. You can just see it. I built a wonder. Damn it! <laughs> My precious gold. I could make an interesting episode of Drunk Civ Gaming, though. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, we're going to do a wonder economy. <laughs> I, just had to, I, just, <laughs> I just had to say that. Drunk Civing. Kids don't drink and sieve. <laughs> <laughs> or do drink and sieve. I hear it's fun, actually. <laughs> I can think of a few other things you can do when you're drunk that are probably even more fun. <laughs> 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 do, 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 duck. This is a family-friendly show. I was going to say, no comments. I cancel the wonder. Take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Sim drinking games now. <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> I'm going to build another wonder. Hit me! <laughs> there, I hit you. 
The true sign of a fanatic. <laughs> I don't even understand how you could really benefit from this. Yes, you have all that gold, but your cities suck. <laughs> so what good is it? What good is your tech league going to do if you're that far behind? Yeah. I mean, if you need cash that bad, just adjust your slide or build a few different wealth buildings. Yeah, do a few turns at 100%. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe he was drunk when he thought of this idea. <laughs> <laughs> In earlier episodes of Polycast with Mackie Blake and myself, we looked at the best and worst wonders of the world pre-Civilization IV Beyond the Sword, and we had some differences of opinion, apparently. And now it's post-Beyond the Sword, and our own Matt G. Nugov said, maybe it's time for a post-Beyond the Sword update of this list. If you want to know what the list was before, have a listen to episodes 11 and 30. Episode 11 had the best, and episode 30 had the worst. And now, post Beyond the Sword, and I got the top five and a worst five, because I had a top ten before. Both of my best and worst lists have changed. Who would like to start? You assume we have lists. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're just going to comment on your list, because that way it's our list in basically at the same time. Oh. It works better for us that way. Oh, that's the way you'd prefer to go again? Mm-hmm. Oh, jeepers. Okay, top five. I will admit that number four and five could call it technically cheating, because it's kind of one of those either and or or combinations, but it's my list and I can do whatever I want with it. It's my list and I can do oh, what God. I want. <laughs> Number five is any two of Broadway, rock and roll, and Hollywood. I had previously referred to them as the modern culture bomb combo back in episode 11, and I will say that again. Number four combined the Great Library and the Great Lighthouse, which I had called the Great Combo back in episode 11. And then number three is the Hanging Gardens because of the variety of benefits. Uh, no other wonder is so diversified from health and population and culture and great people points. And it does not expire. I so hate that in my wonders. Number two, Statue of Zeus. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, attack me at your peril. Like as we talked about earlier, but double the war weariness of civilizations fighting against you and plus ten culture. In number one, by itself, no more Stonehenge with it, is the Oracle. Five worst. It was last time when this got definitely more discussion than the top list. I will say that I no longer have the pyramids on my worst list. Well, we already yeah. were insane for that one. <laughs> I guess you learned something now. <laughs> Number five. We had fun pronouncing this in episode 11. Let's see how we do this time. Chichen Itza. Chicken pizza. Yes. What does that taste like? <laughs> chicken pizza Jeez, mate, those, it tastes like chicken on a pizza what more do you want to know hey I tried that Oreo pizza that sucked <laughs> <laughs> pineapple and cheese okay but Oreo and cheese ugh uh, Americans <laughs> <laughs> yes we put crazy crap on our pizza number four the Hagia Sophia Number three, Shwedagon Paya. I'll explain that a bit, simply because, yes, it does grant access to all religion civics, but as far as I'm concerned, all you need is organized religion, and that's available early on, so met to you. Number two is the Kremlin. That was also on my list before. And number one, yes, it was also on my list. It used to be number two, and now it's at number one, which is Angor Wat. Bleh. So Jan likes to go for the religious stuff. Apparently. <laughs> Um, do national wonders count? Well, it's specifically a best and worst wonders of the world, but if you wanted to talk about national wonders... Okay, because I thought by far the worst wonder in the game right now, if you ask me, is the national park. I really don't see the point in that one. Yeah, I think about the only place you'd want to build that is if you were up in the tundra and you were trying to spread, and it was the non-forested you were trying to spread it. Yeah. But outside of that, yeah... At that point, do you really need another city that late in the game? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> sometimes I like to make my continent pretty. So my lists are not causing either great consternation or great joy. I'll take it. <laughs> but, you know, of the new National Wonders, the Moai statues, that's really great. If you were to start out on a coast, but you had a low amount of hammers, 
or you have that one city that you need to put to keep the AI from settling there, and it's mostly water, then it actually turns it into a somewhat productive city. That one's kind of nice. Yeah, I think that's the whole point with the wonder lists. Uh, so many of them are situational. A certain wonder might be great in one game, but you completely useless in another. So it's really hard to make a list. I agree that Maui is pretty damn useful. I don't have a specific top 5, but I think the Parthenon should be up there as well, at least if you're a builder. Plus 50 great people, a pretty decent bonus. Hanging Gardens, I absolutely agree with, that's pretty powerful. I always confuse the Lighthouse and the Colossus. Colossus, yeah, that's probably uh, the most powerful one. Though they're both pretty good. You really like the Colossus? Yeah, Colossus and Lighthouse as well, really. Combined, they give you, especially on a map with a lot of water, I mean, on Pangea it doesn't help all that much, maybe, but it's a lot of commerce that you can get from that, especially if you're a financial. I only use a Colossus in certain situations. Other than that, I always ignore it. Unless it's a specific city that I can really build up and specialize, I don't like to uh, wonder. Yeah, that's why I tried to go for it. In one coastal city, you try to find a religion there. You try to get the Colossus, the Great Lighthouse, Wall Street. Moe statues. Um, not so much usually, sometimes. And really try to make that a gold city. Concentrate all your gold improvements in there, or uh, science, commerce, rather. So, I think the Great Wall is pretty useless as well. I agree. And it's meh. If you're playing with Raging Barbarians, it can be fun. Yeah. But <laughs> if you play with Raging Barbarians, the whole point is to actually fight the Barbarians, probably. You probably enjoy that. So it's kind of useful if you want to uh, get the AI in trouble. But if you're playing on Raging Barbarians, why are you doing that if you're building Great Wall? I guess Versailles is not to be uh, underrated. Although uh, I usually build the Forbidden Palace first. And let someone else uh, build the uh, Versailles, then I know who to conquer. Because <laughs> if they have time to be building Versailles, then it's time to go get them. Yep, and it means cheap maintenance. Mm -hmm. As far as worst, I agree, Anchor what is pretty damn useless. Yeah, Stonehenge is pretty situational. If you don't have creative, then it's pretty useful. Otherwise, it's pretty useless. Unless you're just into denial strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and same is true for the Guster Redentor. If you have organized already, it's not that useful. You can no longer switch not 20 times per turn. Before it was useful, but that was an exploit. So now, if you're already spiritual, I don't really see the point. Mostly, you know, lists are not terrible, I guess. <laughs> then. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> He's so easily amused. When do you use Musket Man? Diamond Eye has a question pull of his own. When do you use Musket Men in Civ 4? If ever. At this point, when they are my unique units, as Ormo or Janissary is leading, although it's not much of a lead, there's definitely no clear winner here, it's at 29%, and tied for second is other, please specify, and never. Personally, if I have Musket Men, if I happen to be building oh, whatever the hell comes before Musket Men, <laughs> one of the options, would it auto changes for you when you're building something and they say no? Like, wait a minute. <laughs> exactly. If it happens to auto change, that's great. But otherwise, and that Muskman happened to be built while it's my current level of technology for that unit line, then great. But I certainly don't go, oh, musket man, more time. Woo. Wow. Oh, those. Yeah. <laughs> I was confused with the rifleman. I thought, wait a minute, they're pretty useful. But yeah, musket man, almost never. I agree there. They're less powerful than knights in most cases, so I'd rather wait until I get riflemen. They're sometimes useful as uh, city defenders, and they're stronger than longbowmen. Uh, but, yeah, build a handful of them maybe, but... Digital Boy seems to really like him. He skips longbowmen and macemen and goes straight for the musketmen. What's he defending with before musketmen, then, if he's skipping those others? Yeah, yeah if he's skipping longbows. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a big skip. He says, Usually I do this by light bulbing philosophy and part of education with great scientists get gunpowder as a free tech for researching liberalism. So he really he really aims for it. Of course, he also brings up that Musketeers is a UU, so I wonder if he's... Crap, what city is that? Yeah, I think it's French. French. Yes, France. Yeah, I never really try and build them. Just if I have them, I have them. If I don't, who cares? <laughs> As I recall, a promoted longbow is a lot better than a musketman, at least for city defense. 
because it depends how you promoted it. Longbowman gives you 25% bonus on a base strength of 6, so that's 7.5. So yeah, if your city is on a hill or something, then it doesn't make much of a difference. But a musketman is a little bit stronger. Not a whole lot. I mean, it's not enough to spend a lot of money uh, upgrading them, or a lot of hammers replacing them. Hecubus mentions that he'll build them if he has a lot of gold, just because they're quick upgrades to riflemen. That's true, the cheap upgrades probably, if you want to spend that cash. Yeah, he states only does it if he has a lot of gold. If you have a lot of gold, you're doing something else <laughs> wrong probably, so... <laughs> <laughs> I like this one poll option. When do you use musketman? When I have a serious tech lead. Well, if you have a serious tech lead, then... Yeah, why? <laughs> yeah, why not go straight for Just rifle? keep going. <laughs> <laughs> is founding multiple religions an advantage. Lancer does not like the idea of founding multiple religions as it, quote, seems to compete with his own state religion, but puts the question out there. Is he right? Uh, I don't know if you necessarily want to found multiple religions, but it is an advantage to have multiple religions spread, at the very least, within your cities because it opens up more happiness-building options. I like multiple religions, of course. I like going for culture decrease, so multiple regions is always a good thing, but even if you're not going for that, the, like you said, the extra happiness and sometimes the extra gold, though, it, usually I only build a whole bunch of missionaries if I just don't have anything else to build or if it's actually worth the time. And there's also a science advantage with monasteries before they become obsolete as well. Yeah, I mean, more religions is always better. And there is no downside to having more than one religion. I mean, you can wonder if it's really necessary to found them. I don't think that's the case. Although it's nice to have a couple of holy cities in your borders. But yeah, there's no real disadvantage. It's just that if you focus too much on religion, it goes at the expense of other things. And maybe those are more interesting. But other than that, there's no real disadvantage to having multiple religions. Yes, it also depends on what victory you're going for. Or if you're just doing the warmongering, then probably not. But if you're a bit more the builder style. Well, it's still good for the extra temples that you can build that help you with the war areas. Although, yeah, of course, in that case, you're probably going to prioritize units anyway. But it's useful to have them in your city, just in case. Little religion never hurt anyone. <laughs> in Civ, anyway. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, unless you get the Apostolic Palace in there, then that could hurt someone. <laughs> <laughs> that could make me go hurt someone? Definitely, whatever you choose, as far as civics go, when it comes to religion, I don't see any advantage at all for theocracy because it will prevent the spread of anything but your state religion, assuming that you have one. Yeah, well, theocracy gives you free promotions. That's pretty damn powerful as well, so it's still a decent civic for if you're at war. It's plus two. Yeah. Yeah. Still pretty decent as civic, but if you're a warmonger, you're probably going for theocracy. If you're not at war, then there's really no advantage to theocracy. I do agree there. I guess one of the disadvantages is if the religion is spreading into your city is from an AI who has an actual shrine to his holy city, because then you're actually helping him with wealth. But even then, the benefits are you kind of equal out. That's the one thing and the other thing. That's what warfare is for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take his holy city. Exactly. Just don't raise it. Trust me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Politon University. Oh, yeah. I mean, if people do want to uh, learn how to play safe better, there is a good way for comparative playing to have other people give you advice. And we would find that where? Jeez. Uh, Politon.net really? slash forums? Wow. How could I figure that out? I don't know. Politon University. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. I wonder if I'm going to have to go back into the vault for this episode. You might have to. You may have to. <laughs> yeah. You have entered the vault where segments cut from earlier episodes of Find Relevance Later. From episode 1, recorded October 14th, 2006, with Dan Q, Locutus, Makalua, and Imran Siddiqui. I would say one of the interesting things is uh, how much Brian working in England on Civ 2 played such a huge part in it. And I didn't even realize before this interview that he was in England doing this, and this was kind of almost like considered a side project by most at Microprose at the time. You know, they were focusing on Civnet, and a lot of it was just done with him by himself just over across the pond. 
Yeah, that was the most surprising thing to me, that he basically programmed the whole game on himself. It's not even that he was in England. You do the whole game on your own. That's a big task, even in those days. <laughs> yeah, they talked about a lot of the resources being diverted to SIPnet, and SIP2 there really wasn't any kind of marketing for the first two months because they thought the product would sell something like 38,000 units. <laughs> <laughs> but well, colonization had sold around 350,000. So. And first, if it sold even more than that, so why did they, where did they get 30,000 from? I don't know. I guess they thought that people wouldn't want to get a sequel. They would think it would be like Civ with better graphics. But Oh, they were probably thinking in terms of movie sequelitis. Yeah. And I guess they didn't realize that it could actually improve the underlying project or that people would consider that it would improve the underlying game. And they would just say, well, it's a prettier game. And if we want to see nicer graphics, they'll get it. But, you know, there was a lot of small changes, as Brian said, that really made a different playing environment and people ate it up. Did you see that where Brian says there was a Civ 2 wish list in the Newsnet news groups at the time? No! I thought the list was an Apolton original idea. <laughs> <laughs> we did it on the web first, nanner nanner. Did you see the part where he said that Dan Quick gave him all his ideas? Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was Wait a minute. I don't remember that. Oh, sorry, Dan told me that. <laughs> oh. I wish you'd know better than listen to Dan by now. I don't even listen to me sometimes, so it's okay. One of the things I thought was interesting is about the success of Civ 2 kind of pushed the solo game that, you know, kind of downgraded the multiplayer later on. You never know, that sort of thing might have been on Sid's mind or, or when Fraxis started their mind to say people preferred the solo game of Civ 2 than Civ Net. And maybe that was the reason for how long it took to get a functioning multiplayer aspect to Civ. Well, and also considering back then, multiplayer was kind of a pain in the rear anyway. Well, it's true, but it could have had a psychological impact. That's true. Yeah, I don't think Civnet was exactly a title that one wants to talk about in terms of <laughs> multiplayer success. But at the same time, to be fair, Civ games are long, I think, most of the time. Long is a relative term, I do realize that. <laughs> And then, of course, people, if they were trying to play multiplayer game, if it wasn't like a hot seat situation, mm. if you were actually tried to do it online... Yeah, it'd be a pretty long game, except if they played against me, and then it'd be pretty quickly, I guess. Because you would just kick everybody's butt, right? No. Is that what you mean? <laughs> From the first pilot recorded September 1st, 2006, with Jan Q, Locutus, and Makalua. GameSpot posted an article listing some great games that don't require great hardware. Most of the games listed are relatively old, but there are also some newer titles like Civilization IV and Heroes of Might and Magic V. Yeah, I object to that. Civ IV does not require a strong computer. I know a lot of people feel that way, but the only thing that needs to be even remotely strong is your video card. Even then, GeForce 2 is good enough, and GeForce 2 was first released in early 2000. That's almost a year before Civ 3 came out. So, I don't really agree with that last statement. I had just a standard integrated video card, so I had to get a separate one that supported TNL and had greater yeah, memory. That's you know. the biggest thing. A lot of people have integrated graphics, and yeah, that just doesn't work. Uh, it mm. doesn't have any of the proper features you need for basically any game. There are some games that run, but you really need to get a separate graphics card if you want to play games. Yeah, like the integrated one I had was only 32 meg beside. I now have one that's 128 meg. My choices were limited for me. I've got one of those, I call them slimline PCs. It's an older Dell where the case just isn't as large. So not as many expansion ports, don't have a lot of options there. And I was also mm. hesitant, as much as I want to play games all the time, I can't. So there was a hesitation to spend the hundreds of dollars because you can go pretty sweet in terms of the price and what you can get in terms of cost. Sure, but, but this cost $80 Canadian. Exactly. For Civ 4, you don't need that. All you need is a graphics card. I've seen graphics cards, if you buy them today, that cost 30 euros. That's maybe $40 or so. And that can play Civ 4 just fine. So I don't think that qualifies as high maintenance in terms of hardware. No, am I? No, because they're pushing newer, better graphics cards out all the time, which makes the kind of the mid-range ones, range cheaper, ones yeah. drop really fast. I'd have to look. I believe it's in Radeon 9700, and that was just maybe 110 US when I got it, and that's 
Yeah, I have something similar. I have a 9800 Pro, but it was also 120 euro, I think, is slightly more. But it was just three years ago, I think, that those cards were 400, 500 euros. So they've dropped really fast in price. Yeah, whenever... And they're really, really good, uh, good cards as well. Yeah, it's the first two things I usually, when I get asked computer stuff by people who aren't as knowledgeable, first two things I tell them that they would probably do best upgrading is the video card and the memory. Yeah, if you want a game, of course. Yeah. If you don't want a game, you don't need it. My computer has just one gig of memory. Just. And, yeah, and the only time I consistently had to lower my in-game's graphics revolution in CIV 4 from high to medium was in a later game where I had a huge size map with hundreds of units of dozens of cities on it, and that's after I'd played the game for 20, 30, 40 yeah, minutes, so nothing to complain about there. That yeah, is the working... one problem with CIV 4. It needs a lot of memory if you play on a big map late in the game, a lot of stuff in there. Then it requires a lot of memory. I found that I've got... I'm not going to mention the product name because they still don't endorse this show. I don't understand what's wrong with people. Damn. I have this software, and what it does is it recovers lost memory, which is wonderful. So if you don't have software like that, find software that's legitimate. I'm not saying go out and pirate it. Don't do that. You either recover lost memory or give your computer a good reboot and maybe clear up some of that stuff in the system tray. Yeah, that can make a big difference. When I first got so 4, I only had 512 megabyte of memory, but I could still play yeah. up to the medium kind of size map, and it was exactly. still ran pretty well up until the end of the game where, and I might have to drop a little bit if force is just not going to run well. No, that's true. But 512 is enough. It runs fine, as long as you don't do the biggest maps. From episode 12, recorded March 31st, 2007, voices heard in order of first presentation are Dan Q, Bing, Makalua, Grand Patrol, Stani, Metalla Turtle, and Aussie KP. Uh, these are honorable mentions. Some of these were originally in draft versions of my top 10 list, and I'm sure I'll hear you got rid of that one for. But anyway. You got rid of that one for that? I have to say one first before that makes sense. Sorry. From T100, your girlfriend has already left you with a month still left until release. More time for Sue? That's good! I like this handle from Farting Bob. <laughs> okay. How would you like to be known as, oh, I'm Farting Bob. Hi, I'm Flatulent Frank. How you been, buddy? Oh, sorry. Wow, it took that long for a fart joke. I think we should be very happy with ourselves and our maturity. <laughs> good. <laughs> Have you been listening to this? We have some standards and practices. Not that we follow them, but we do have them. From Farting Bob, you can spell Montezuma faster than you can spell your wife's name, and her name is Amy. <laughs> that's a Why? good one. <laughs> See, that should have been number one. Yeah, how'd you leave that one out? Do you have any other funny ones then? Because it sounds like you left all the good ones off. Let me show you something shiny. <laughs> what? Where? Ah, oh, hey, come on now. Give us another shiny Okay. One. From Bob Bob Jack. I probably took this one off the list because of that. Was he from South Carolina? <laughs> oh, oh, diet. <laughs> You're amazed by the box art and start looking where you could put it in your house for decorational purposes. <laughs> yeah. You left that off the list. You're for welcome. Thank you. I mean, that's a given that you're going to keep the box for art. I mean, you know. From Ladoz, your mailbox at work now says great engineer instead of IT department. There's another sick puppy. It's a good one. I like that. <laughs> I think that's sarcasm. Oh. <laughs> From B Man 003, you do full scale tests to see if a spearman can actually beat a tank. <laughs> that's that's good. Number one. That is, that's good. Now that's funny. From Colonel, you go out and get a bunch of animals to name after Civ 4 leaders. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Yeah. And this was an honorable mention. Well, see, I did go through more than a thousand, so maybe that's a testament to just how good the rest of them were. <clears throat> I think Is so. Is that sarcasm, too? <laughs> <laughs> From Older Than Dirt, you search the Internet to buy a ticket to ride the space elevator. Yeah. See? Okay. See? Next. Next. From... And you actually have a long Yeah, I got a few more. Stuff. See? Oh, that, please, please continue. continue. I told you. You probably wouldn't want me to go through them all, but you just keep encouraging me, so it's your own fault. So here's a tie-in from Rancid Sushi. Oh. <laughs> the handles are better than the quotes. You hope that your country has the highest score before 2050 AD. Oh, you mean in real life? <laughs> yes, in real life. Yes, there is such a thing. Did you leave off the punchline? <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. 
Yeah, isn't the punchline so you win? Yeah, thank, you thanks for that, Dan. <laughs> winner, winner, winner! From the mad Swede, your neighbors look strangely at you after you've rearranged the picket fence around your house into a fat cross. That yeah, actually has some on. to it. Come on. Compared <laughs> to the other crappy ones. And now, from your mom. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love what she told <laughs> Yes, the handles are indeed better than the course. From your mom. What, you're on Polycast? I thought I raised you better. No, wait, that's not on here. Oh. 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 <laughs> you wonder about your country's current tax, science, and luxury rate. You see why I left that one off? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm surprised you kept that on <laughs> It was a stretch, I know. Be still, my keen heart. He has only one left. And from Congregation, you actually read this whole topic from start to finish. Or better yet, you made a radio show about it. You're welcome. I guess that only applies to me. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, we listened. We get the full credit, too. We participated even worse. It's true. Research Lab. Research Lab. Also known as the Lab of Research. I feel like a scientist. <laughs> Welcome to the Research Lab, where we explore game concepts or ideas that are not in civilization yet, but they might be in the future. There are three ideas for corporations. For those who may or may not be aware or have forgotten, corporations were introduced again with the Beyond the Sword expansion pack, Force of Four, and Shaka is King has three ideas that he believes will change their implementation for the better. Some of them are more complicated than others. Uh, the first is probably the most simple of the three, at least to explain. It's a new type of corporation, military corporations, to go with the resource and food type of corporations, as he's categorized them, which I think is fair, where you have this new type, military corporations, and you populate them with four examples that could be founded by a particular combination of great engineer, great general, or great scientist. This sounds like the same kind of argument that they wanted more religions. Yeah, you can add more corporations if you want, but... Yeah, there's seven already. How many do you really found in an average game? I rarely see more than two anyway, so I'm not sure that we need a lot more of those. I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with having military effects to them, but yeah, there's enough corporates already, really. Making a corporation involving around military, which is usually one of the very stronger aspects of the game, just doesn't seem right to begin with. Most people are warmongers anyway. This is just too easily abused. I don't like it. To an extent, that's true, but these effects aren't overly overpowered. It just depends on you if you balance them. You could make it work, although I agree in general, I don't really see a need for it. But if you wanted to. The second suggestion is to link corporations to buildings to encourage what uh, Shaka as King sees as a more strategic approach than just spreading them, quote-unquote, anywhere and everywhere. I wouldn't agree that that's what we do now, but anyway. Saying that the nature of the corporation and the geographic location of the city will determine the base benefit from its headquarters, and then once a corporation is founded, any other city's improvements in geography determine how likely the corporation will spread elsewhere. With Sitsushi, if you found a city that is inland, you would get a 50% penalty due to a lack of fresh fish locally, whereas there would be no penalty for a coastal city. And then in spreading it, if a coastal city has a harbor, it gets a 50% bonus, 50% better chance of spreading it than without. And I'm inferring that you could not spread Sid Sushi to cities that are inland. He doesn't explicitly say that, I don't think, but that's how I interpreted it. If anything, I would say that if, if it's an inland city, as long as it's still connected to the coast, to a city on the coast, but either way, I think this idea is just, you're putting too much into something. It's just It's not worth it. Yeah, you could argue later on that it would be easier, depending upon the distance from a coastal city to an inland city, to actually get fish that is fresh to an inland city more easily. But then again, that's one of those realism versus gameplay considerations, and that's just complicating things unnecessarily, I think. Yeah, I'm quite far in from the coast. We can get fresh fish, so <laughs> there are sushi bars around here. Yeah, this is just complication for complication's sake. I don't think this is really uh, terribly useful. I can think of more important things to address. Bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Shaka is King's third idea is contracts to ensure the safety of your type of corporation against a rival corporation. Through diplomacy, you submit a tender if you want to expand one of, if you have more than one, one of your corporations into a rival's territory, and that would trigger the opportunity for other civilizations with a corporation to submit a tender too. If the winning civilization fails to fulfill its requirements, it will suffer a diplomatic hit and possibly even have its corporation's branches kicked out of the rival territory, further suggesting a link to espionage with a corporate mission where you could learn the particulars of a rival's civ proposals in order to make better on them. I like the idea of the espionage component because I think espionage is a, a nice an expansion in Beyond the Sword, and I like the system and would like to have reason to use it more myself. But as far as the idea of contracts in and of themselves sounds a bit complicated, especially this part about triggering the opportunity for other civilizations to submit a tender as well. Uh. I know, it sounds like something you would do in a multiplayer with all human players, but again, it's one of those things of trying to get the AI to understand that. Because as a human player, I'm not quite sure I understand that. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I like the idea as well of tying corporations into other elements of the game, such as diplomacy and espionage, but yeah, this sounds a bit complicated. Yeah, it seems too complicated for me. It would probably be a neat mod, though, something I would try out, but I don't want it in the main game. Yeah, it's a mod that would be interesting to play with. I'm sure you can find some kind of implementation of tying corporations into other systems that would make it more interesting. I'm not sure that this is it, but it's definitely something to play with. It had, it'd be probably really tough to get the AI to understand it, like Mackie said. But as a multiplayer game, that could be pretty interesting. I'm always going for state property because of the espionage bonus, 25% bonus. And I really don't like corporations anyway, and I like the idea of increased espionage. So this isn't enough for me to say, okay, because of this system, I would then entertain the idea of corporations. I tried it a couple of times, and it was just bleeding my economy dry. Okay, so yes, mailbag. Mailbag. Michael Lucas Smith, I unfortunately kept referring to him by his middle name. Sorry about that, Michael. Michael Lucas Smith followed up with a voicemail, and he talks about why he believes diplomacy is broken in multiplayer. So this sounds like something for Mackie especially to address, since she knows more about this playing of multi things. I, I don't know. What the... <laughs> that can be taken so bad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's Michael from Australia here again. Thanks for playing my comment. Thanks for all the wonderful comments and not so wonderful comments. Oh, yeah, and thanks for calling me Lucas constantly. Anyway, I'm calling up to complain about diplomacy between humans in multiplayer Civ games. It just doesn't work. You know, it takes me three or four turns to actually get a message through to somebody that they should actually do diplomacy. Clicking on the, the name there with the phone call, people often don't respond at all. You know, I often play with one guy who takes me three or four turns of saying trade, 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 for him to even pick it up, even though it's in his best interest to actually trade with me. I think this system doesn't work because it requires the negotiation actually talking to happen before you can then get to the negotiation of what you want to negotiate. The best time that I ever had in any kind of negotiation in a multiplayer game was when some guy I'd never met before gifted me a bunch of units. At that point, I knew we were going to have a good relationship. But when it comes to actually ending wars or trading resources or gifting gold or anything like that, it just doesn't work. What I'd like to see is more like unit trading, where you can just gift something to someone. You should be able to just throw some idea out on the table, like, hey, I'll give you this for that. And if that deal's still valid, that deal can sit on the table until you decide you don't want to offer it anymore, and that, or they decide to accept it, or you want to cancel it, etc. That way, opening up borders, trading resources, trading cities, trading gold, all that kind of stuff becomes easy, and you don't have to wait for the person to actually notice. It can pop up like any of the other events that pop up on the right-hand side in sequential order, or if you've got the wrong option on, it can pop up in your face. And it also gives you the opportunity to do what the AI is doing, refuse to talk to someone. If they keep offering you crap, which you really don't care about, just refuse to talk to them. Anyway, that's my rant about diplomacy in multiplayer games. Diplomacy with people, it just doesn't work the way it's done right now. Bye. 
So, on multiplayer, the thing comes up on the right? Yeah, it just sort of flashes at you, and there's a little <laughs> kind of phone sound. I guess most of my diplomacy stuff that I've had has been with the PBM games, which are a bit slower, so people do notice the trade window because it pops up when you come in to do your turn. But I could see if you were doing a quicker one, just like on GameSpy or something, how people would probably ignore you during that. But when I've played in the Saturday game, people have done a little bit of diplomacy, even though it is a faster game. So I guess it just depends on the speed and the crowd you're with, maybe. Well, PBM, you could just, when you email them to save, you could just do the trade that way. Also pit boss too. Oh. That's what I was meant to say. Sorry. <laughs> I guess you are only multiplayer here. Yep. <laughs> I must be. <laughs> well, I think it's quite obvious that Michael listens to the show a fair bit, and everyone knows that people want Mackie to talk more, so because of that, she knew that Mackie would have to answer this question. <laughs> it seems to me that the interface itself, I assume it's the same interface as Blomsy with the AI? Mm-hmm. Except it has a chat window in the middle that's just between you and the other player. Makes sense. I mean, it seems to me that that basically would be pretty suitable. You can exchange whatever you want. If it's not noticeable enough, maybe it should be like a pop up uh, hey, pay attention, you have a message, something like that. Now, since everybody else is still playing the time, does that kind of block you from seeing what everybody else is doing, or, or does it kind of pause the game while you're doing your diplomacy? Oh, no, timer's still going. A lot of the diplomacy negotiation, when it's a normal multiplayer, is done actually just by the private player-to-player chat, and then you just pop up the window long enough to trade whatever it is you've agreed upon. That's how you want to do it anyway, multiplayer. There's not much a point staying in the window for a long time. Yeah, because they could be trying to distract you. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Look, trade, shiny. Where? Where? Dan. <laughs> down, down, calm down. You teased me again, didn't you? Not on purpose, not on purpose. <laughs> hey, you too. <laughs> Get some water. <laughs> Clip from the pre-pilot recorded August 29th, 2006. Not being able to see each other, it's hard to say when someone is about to speak. Well, that's what will make this all the more interesting. And that's true. I like the shows. The podcast has grown. I just went reading. I know for a while you guys were kind of specializing a little bit. And it kind of went back to where you just kind of bounce around and do different topics. Because now you had a few people complain that you would take certain topics and talk about them the, was it most of the time. You're talking about like the episodes right after Beyond the Sword was announced where we focused extensively on that. And people were like, oh, thank goodness, not an episode that's not just BTS cast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I think a couple of the co-hosts complained about that. Oh, wait, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we try to experiment with different themes sometimes for an episode, either intentionally going in or just happens to be incidental. Just like when it comes to the different types of segments that we include. We have our regulars, and then we have our more occasional ones. What is your favorite segment on Polycast, Mythos? Possibly the Modcast or the Senate, though, since it's kind of fun to talk about some of the actual uh, threads where people discuss different things. It's kind of interesting. Mailbag can be good, depending on what the mail was. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends on the topic. Certain topics I'll just skip. Each person's going to like their own different things. Exactly. It's always a balance to have something in an episode for everyone most of the time, but sometimes there's a reason to really emphasize one aspect over the other, like a Beyond the Sword cast or a Civ Rev cast kind of thing. Who's your favorite guest co-host? <laughs> no, I liked a lot of them, so I just said screw it and put me. <laughs> that way I had at least one. <laughs> of course, I also chose me because I thought, well, I wouldn't mind coming back and just again. Call in today. 301-637-659. 301-637-POLLY. 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLLY. Or you can Skype us at The Polycast. Log on to the official Polycast website at polycast.apolton.net. Cell phones can be annoying at times. 
unless you set it to vibrate. I did now. <laughs> Somebody call! <laughs> In honor of Imran. <laughs> This is the final regular episode of Polycast for the 2007 calendar year, but we have a Christmas present for everyone that will be released just before that big day. (laughs) Money? I'm not releasing money, no. (laughs) No. I'm not bank. Oh, bank! My university? Oh, (laughs) tie-in. Some people might argue that it's better than money. (laughs) I think some of those people need to get out more. <laughs> that is very good, actually. <laughs> it's been another great episode of the podcast. Our host, Dan Q, Mackie, Louder, and of course me, Mythos. It's been fun talking to y'all. Later. Bye. Bye. Hi, bye. date December 8th, 2007. Soundtrack courtesy Civilization for Warlords and Beyond the Sword. Copyright 2007, Apolton Civilization site at apolton.net. <laughs> <laughs>